The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you Lecture 1B of the Pictures at an Exhibition Orchestration Analysis. Now, you might be wondering, 1A, 1B, 1C, the reason why I'm numbering things and breaking things up this way is because, technically, even though the promenade that we just studied in the last lecture introduces the entire suite of works, it also introduces the first work, the Nomus movement. So we just have to treat it in that context. So 1A, the promenade, 1B, Nomus part one, and 1C will be Nomus part two. Our first lecture is going to be a little bit shorter, and the second one is going to be twice as long. The reason for that is that it's just easier to cover the kinds of scoring that Ravel approaches at the beginning, including interpreting this repeated section here. So just as we did before, let's look at Mussorgsky's original piano score, and then after listening to it, we'll compare it to Ravel's orchestration section by section. Now notice the key relationship before we get started. The promenade ended on a beautiful B-flat major chord. Now we're starting in on E-flat minor. And it's interesting the way that this first phrase is scored, starting on C, ending on G-flat, going twice, and then the entire group of phrases ends on a series of B-flats. The dominant to E-flat, but we still don't hear a decided E-flat except for just in passing with these little phrases. When we get past the repeat, we definitely settle in on an identifiable E-flat minor. And you'll notice as we go through this suite that Ravel preserves the key signatures of Mussorgsky's original score. He doesn't make any changes. So not that it's impossible for string players to play in six flats, it's just inconvenient and the players will have to negotiate around it. It's a lot like F-sharp minor, I guess, which is also a bit annoying to play. But it's not impossible for pro players, and Ravel knew that Kusevitsky, the person who commissioned him, would be conducting some of the best orchestras in the world. So that didn't really enter into any consideration for him, I'm sure. So if we just look at these episodes, we have one phrase group, then a shorter phrase group, and then we have this lovely section here repeated. Bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, and then just continuing on. And I love this little ending here. Boom boom. Coming back here, virtually identical to what happened before in terms of this phrase group here. There's a little bit of difference here. Ba -da -da -ba -da -da -bum -bum. All right. So just some minor changes here and there to make things more interesting. So two things that the orchestrator has to take into consideration here. One is the dramatic intent of the original composer. You know, what is this portraying? Well, in this case, Gnomus, a fiendish little gnome who is flitting about the place, a bit like the evil little dwarf in Ravel's movement Scarbo, right? Although this music is very different from Scarbo. So Ravel would have already had that in mind as a dramatic object for himself. So that sense of scurrying has to be amplified through orchestration. Okay, not hard to do if you just follow the directions left behind by Mussorgsky. Then the other thing is what colors are going to be used. And we will see how Ravel masterfully picks the right instruments and then contrasts them and then makes the contrasts feel inevitable.
and especially here on this repeat, we will see the music come back with a beautiful contrast. In fact, in the orchestral score itself, there are no repeats. The section is just duplicated, one end on the other, and then a different orchestration scheme is chosen for the written out repeat. So it is actually fairly simple piano scoring, though it does require a lot of dexterity, as I mentioned in our introductory lecture. Just basically playing octaves with both hands, then adding an octave, and so on. And this is all very simple to play. Bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, just pretty basic. But to pull it off, and to really commit to it, you cannot be clumsy, you cannot be careless, you have to be completely focused when you play this as a pianist. So let's have a listen to this music, and then we will jump over to Ravel's score. And now for the first section of Ravel's interpretation of that last page. Let's go back to the very beginning of the score. As you can see, like I said before, the key signature of six flats is maintained. And let's also talk about the tempo and the time signature. So this is a very fast 3-4. The word vivo does really not convey how fast this is. And let's take a quick look at how our conductor for the music that I'm using, Alfonso Scarano, conducts the Thailand Philharmonic Orchestra. He will conduct it in one, as you'll see from this clip. <laughs> So did you notice how he was giving a strong downbeat at the beginning of each bar, but he wasn't necessarily beating out every single individual beat? And that is the approach that will be assumed when you're going this fast with a 3-4. It almost could have been a 6-8, but I'm glad that it's not. It's just a very fast 3-4. Now let's look at the scoring of the first bar. So we've got A2 clarinets and bass clarinet playing octaves. So this is perfectly balanced. These instruments are playing exactly the same register for each instrument, and they are taking advantage of the same tonal peculiarities in each respective register, right? So they're both playing in their deep shallow registers. Now this is not the easiest thing in the world to do, by the way, play very fast things in the Shalomo register, but it still works beautifully when the player is good. Then we've got doubling for these pitches with the violas and cellos, and then of course the cellos playing octaves themselves, and the bottom of the octave is being doubled by the double basses, right? So we've got that octave covered in the strings and in the bassoons. The bassoons are covering the same pitches as the clarinets. And notice that it's going very deep. We've got a concert D natural here, which is interpreted as a written E natural, which is about the lowest that a standard B-flat clarinet can go. And here we've got our contrabassoon covering the bottom line of the bassoon. So really, it's just a note-for-note -note transcription of that opening phrase of octaves in the piano. Now here we get into our first little bit of craft trickery. 
the phrase ends with a staccato for all the other instruments, but dovetails straight into these D flats on the horns. Our second horn is playing all the way down there on a concert G flat, so a pretty low note. It just shows you that horns can actually play fairly low and not too difficult either if the music is scored well. But the whole effect here is the horns are carrying on the pitch as if this were the held note on the piano and notice how it fades off just like a piano. So Ravel is trying to simulate the actual sound of the piano hitting that firm note and then dying off naturally. And the result is quite an evil sound, I think. Just really wonderfully macabre. Meno vivo. And you probably notice that Alfonso Scarano did not start beating out every single beat in the bar, even though the music was slower. He just conducted in one slower. And that's really what the players need. They don't need a variation of approach when they are watching a conductor. So same approach as before in terms of interpreting the octaves, except that the bassoons and contrabassoon are left out. And of course, everybody's playing softer and slower. And we've also dropped the second clarinet. So it has a lighter sound and sort of a more thoughtful sound. And the note that is held afterwards is muted. Not stopped, but muted. Here's the reason. This low D flat down here would sort of sound kind of farty and silly if it were hand stopped. So a stop mute takes care of that problem. And it sounds wonderfully snarly. I like to think of this reaction here as kind of like an echo. The perspective of the viewer of the painting is walking into the domain of the gnomus, or maybe the gnomus is walking into the viewer's domain, and you hear this loud noise and you see a flash of light. And then this is like, did I actually see that? <laughs> it's the moment of questioning, of doubtfulness. Did, you know, did that actually happen? Let me go over that in my mind slower. And then, yes, indeed, it did happen. Here we see a lot of compromising because of the lowering pitch. Notice how the clarinets leave out some pitches as they descend. So, for instance, this concert D flat is too low for a B flat clarinet. It would work fine with an A clarinet, but there's really no need to do that because we've got that same note here. This would be the note that would be required by the clarinets up here. So the bass clarinet just covers that same low E flat, which would be a half step below this low E here. Right? So it is just played by the bass clarinet. And any other time that the music gets too low, the bass clarinet just kind of plays it for the clarinets. So once again, it's a very simple doubling of clarinets, bass clarinets, and the two bassoons plus the contrabassoon basically playing the lower pitches, but throwing in a low note here and there, like this C flat here, which is in the range of the second bassoon, but since the bass clarinet is compensating for the clarinets, it just moves everything up a file, sort of just like everything jumping up. So the contrabassoon just covers this note at the bottom. And we see that same approach down here, pretty much identically scored in the double basses. And here you see the Divisi cellos combining on a line with just a little bit of viola here, once again, leaving out notes that are too low, similar to the clarinets. And we end with this bum bum. Here we get the upper winds finally coming in. And pretty simple. This is a three flutes because this is still just the grand flute, right? And then a two oboes, an octave below that and third oboe, an octave lower. Clarinets are doubling those two pitches in the first and second, then lower third oboe. 
and on down the line there. And we just have very simple B flat octave jump in the first and second violins and then an octave lower in the violas. Now I've put off analyzing the layout of the orchestra because it's all really standard. It's just you know, triple winds with the auxiliaries already there or coming in later. And then of course horns, three trumpets, three trombones plus tuba, timpani, and so on. One harp rather than two, and then strings. But let's talk about the percussion. So we've got cymbal, we've got bass drum, and then here we see activated snare drum. Look at the notation here. For the snare drum, he wants a two stick stroke on that single pitch. But think about this notation here, the staccato on the cymbals. Here we don't have one, but it's still a short note. It's followed immediately by a rest. So this is just meant to be an extremely short hit crash cymbal, but then damped immediately against the chest. And then of course there's a big bass drum hit, which will be the main thing that you hear here. Now here, Ravel's job is extremely easy. All he's got to do is really just copy and paste. This section here is copied onto here. And then this section here, these three bars, are copied onto here there's essentially no difference between those two sections. The big difference here is just that there are three octave notes in a row. Bum, bum, bum. Sorry, I can't really sing the actual pitches without getting all operatic on you here and killing my microphone. Going back to the distribution of percussion, the low B is going to get the bass drum hit. The middle B is going to have the snare drum and then the top B is going to hear just a dash of very short cymbal. And this sounds just really cool. It's a great way of distributing the different percussion colors across the rising octaves. As for the rest, it's all really basic. You know, just look at it. We've got our low octave here the two B-flats doubling in second violins and viola, and then an octave lower than that, we've got contrabasses hitting this B-flat, and then B-flat an octave higher in the cellos from the basses, and doubling the same note on viola this time, and then doubled first and second violins, and then reaching another octave higher, then we've got the high B-flat in the firsts there's really no need to score it out so elaborately, except that it makes everybody's job really simple. Each string player only has to jump an octave this way, rather than the cellos having to go B-flat, B-flat, B-flat. I warned you about me getting operatic. And then the violas would have to leave out the bottom B-flat anyways, and so on. It's just a way of simplifying things for everybody and using the full range of the strings in a very simple way. And we see the same thing here in the horns. So low horns, second and fourth, sorry about these low notes being cut off down here, playing that B flat octave written F and then octave higher with the firsts and thirds. And we've got something similar happening here as happened in the violas with the clarinets, with the third oboe doubling this bottom line here, and the bassoons playing the actual octave jump with the contrabassoon doubling the double basses. So the only wind instruments that cover all three positions are the three flutes. And I've warned against scoring lower notes in the staff against a fortissimo tutti, but here it's going to work because of just the punchy origin of the note going into the octaves, so it'll work fine. So this is all a very simple yet very beautifully crafted approach. And yes, every single idea, every single page, every single orchestration that comes from the mind of a master does not need to be intricately scored and put the players and the conductor to too much trouble. 
Sometimes it's better to take the simplest approach possible, and I think that this is incredibly effective, even if it is simple. So let's have a listen to this page, and keep in mind that the scoring is going to get a bit more intricate and colorful and imaginative following on the next screen. Now we go to the bridge, as it were. This little idea, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, and so on. And Ravel starts with the first iteration in a very simple arrangement. Once again, keeping things basic, very easy for the ear to understand and for the players to play. Flutes doubled exactly on pitch with oboes. So those chords are realized between first, second, and third flute, first, second, and third oboe. At the end, he tells the third oboist, change to English horn. As this idea descends, we have the clarinets take over, and that is actually a really great combination with the flutes here. The clarinets will tend to dominate a little bit, and hopefully there can be a little bit of balancing here, but when it's done correctly, it'll really have a beautiful sound and provide a lovely contrast as it descends. It won't be completely homogeneous from this phrase to this phrase. Rather, it will just gain a new meaning as it descends. And of course, a little bit of the identity of double reeds will be taken up by this lovely high G flat in the first bassoon. Falling down here, coming down to this C flat, which is the same note doubled here by bass clarinet. And then ending with bump bump, played by bass clarinet, both bassoons, and an octave lower by the contra bassoon. We've also got first and third horn doubling at an octave above and cellos plus double basses. Now let's see how the rest of this texture is built up because it really is fascinating. This is neat and of course it's carrying the chordal melody and that's all cool but it's really the setting of these phrases that interests me as an orchestrator. So we've got this pluck here, this low E flat. Once again finally letting us know firmly that we are in E flat minor, doubled by contrabassoon on this very lowest double bass note. Repeated here as the next phrase echoes. Then <laughs> two strokes on timpani, bum bum, and one little xylophone hit on an F, which is doubling this F here in the violins. So, notice that these violins are basically plucking the first chord of this phrase here, and then coming in whenever there's an accent and a staccato. Bum 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 bum. We have pluck, pluck. Then, same strategy here. Beautiful high voice crossing here of the violas, playing this high F, and then staying on top of the seconds all the way through. That's really neat. And it actually works, I think, better with having the first flute and first clarinet double that top note to combine with a viola pizzicato, just because you get the longer string, slightly longer sustain and slightly richer tone. And then, of course, the xylophone remains as the top note throughout, doubling this viola pizzicato getting all the way down to this lowest A flat for the phrase. So that is the punctuation behind these phrases and below them. But this really pulls the entire page together for me as an orchestrator. Low E flat in muted tuba, 
rising up an augmented fourth to A natural, and then all the way up here to this G flat, which is taken over by a muted trumpet. It's just a lovely sound, and the players can really, really attempt here to blend when they get to this note, if they're really listening to each other. And that's something that the conductor can request, by the way. They can say, hey, can you guys try to come together a little bit more blended on that G flat? And then you'll have both players just really listening and anticipating what the tone quality will be like by the time they get here. Now, muted tuba. <laughs> okay, mutes are used for wind, brass, and string instruments, not necessarily just to make things softer, but more to create a certain kind of effect. Because with a mute, you are taking out a certain part of the harmonic spectrum, of the overtones that are ringing above the fundamental tone that the instrument is playing. And it can even suppress the fundamental tone, depending on the kind of mute, and bring out the higher resonance. The whole effect is not just the suppression, but it is the accentuation or allowing through which particular partials of overtones. With a tuba, there's a tendency to make things a lot more trebly, right? And that really works blending in together with the first trumpet when you have players who are really just trying to play off of each other. And this happens twice. And I feel that this actually adds more <laughs> than all of the other little bits and pieces that Ravel has put together, although they all work great. But this really is where my attention is focused because it's so creepy, right? The gnome has flashed through our consciousness. He's terrified us. He's menaced us. And now he is creeping around in the shadows and just seeing if he can slowly get us more and more scared <laughs> because that's his weapon, right? It's suspense. It's fear. He actually, he's just this little tiny guy with maybe some sharp claws and some fangs. But what, I mean, what could he really do to you? He's it'd probably be about the same thing as taking on a chihuahua right? <laughs> or, you know, a very angry little poodle or something like that. So what he's got going for him is just the fear of the unknown, and that is what Ravel is bringing out here. Let's have a listen to everything now, right? Noting all of the different changes that are requested, for instance, like mutes here and then take the mutes off, and the markings of pizzicato, unison here from the divisi in the double basses, uh, the change to English horn, all those different little things. You know, always keep your eye on what's happening at the entrance of an instrument. Is it the first instrument playing? Is it A2? Right? Is it the third playing? So those are all things you need to pay attention to as a score reader and as a conductor. Especially as a conductor, you need to know who to gesture to, right? So if the entrance is for the third and you think it's for the first, you may just wave your arms at the wrong player and then either be lucky to have the right player come in on time or just make everybody get lost. So let's hear this page, watch for all those things, and then we'll check out the second iteration of this on the next screen. Now, here at figure nine, you're finally seeing the master orchestrator that Ravel truly was. After all of that fairly simple, fairly direct, but yet very craftsmanlike approach up to here, you finally see the beautiful subtlety, the wonderful color painting, and the knowingness that Ravel had about instrumentation. Let's reverse the order in which we studied things, more or less. Do you remember the low muted tuba line that reached up to join with the muted trumpet? Here we've got just a single bass clarinet, soft, right? Contrast exactly how the pianist did, softer than the mezzo forte first iteration. And by the way, these are the same pitches, that low E flat, and then this is technically an A natural and so on. This is a G flat in concert pitch. And this is also G flat because remember we've got our F transposition, right? So down a perfect fifth. 
and this is read down a ninth, right? So it's exactly the same pitch as before. It's just written up an octave plus a major second. So same pitches, very low and creepy. There's a beautiful creepy quality to bass clarinet when it's very exposed in this kind of emotional context. And it reaches up to an instrument that actually does not blend with it very well, but can still make it feel like an emotional resolution. And that is stopped horn, right? So we've got this stopped concert G flat, and it just is a killer. Really listen to it when we hear the orchestra along to this, because they do a beautiful job. Then we've got the punctuation, these low plucked E flats, double bass, and coming back again here with an octave. But at the end, boom, boom. We don't have massed lower winds and horns and strings. We actually have the harp. Now the harp is joining in on the punctuation at the same actual sounding pitches as these plucked violins. Notice, divisi in three. So that means that there will be less violins plucking per note. So it will necessarily be softer, even more so because it's got a piano marking, which makes it perfect to be doubled by harp. Once again, the harpist is playing at the pitch that their fingers are going to be hitting the strings and it will be sounding an octave higher. So these pitches will combine with the violins and it has a most beautiful effect when it is very carefully balanced. So this just follows the violins and then the rest of the strings as it descends going to more comfortable, more playable areas in this case the violas, and they're getting down here to this F that the violins can't reach and they're doing something else anyways, and so on. So basically just following all the way through, combining with the harps. Then we've got our little chordal melody played completely by Celesta. And I find that really charming. So it's almost like our gnome is actually kind of cute, right? And the cuteness makes it all the more horrifying. <laughs> you know, sort of like um, a hot topic score. A hot topic store gets taken over by Stephen King. <laughs> That's what I kind of think of here. Okay, and then finally, here is the master stroke on top of the other master strokes, and that is this beautiful arcing trading off glissando here. Now it will feel like a harmonic glissando because the player will basically be covering an octave on open strings for the first two pitches and then here it's kind of going from E flat to D. This is still going to be on the D string and this will be a uh, open A. Arco sur la touche, so in other words, sul tasto, with the bow played over the fingerboard. And I've heard this referred to as poor man's mutes. In other words, there's just not enough time to put a mute on, or maybe you don't want to take out that particular part of the harmonic spectrum from your instruments, but you still want to have it feel muted. So what you do is you just have them play softly, but add sul tasto, or sur la touche. And here the players will be basically running their fingers kind of softly up and down the string because they don't want to really press down on the fingerboard very firmly because they're going all the way up to this harmonic, right? So it ends up having the effect of a harmonic glissando without actually notating it out laboriously. All right, so this would be one way to do that if you just wanted to save time and everybody would get that it was sort of a harmonic glissando. And while yet not fussing over the exact pitches or anything like that. So really just goes up and down on a D octave, up and down on an A octave, then E flat up to D, pretty much the same as before. Then A again, an octave higher than the cellos. And what's very cool about this is that the harmonics work 
in a chilling way against the harmonic cuteness of the passage. When we get to this A, it particularly underlines that potential dissonance of having the A in the bass. I just think it's wonderfully chilling and it's great and it just adds to the overall impression here of adorable madness. <laughs> so think about all of those particular effects. Really try to notice things as you go along and I would say this is one of those little passages where you could focus on a different element each time. You could start with the chordal melody, the celesta, and how it's being backed up by harmonics on the harps and pizzicato with divided violins working their way down into the violas. And then you could listen again for how the bass clarinet rises and has this beautiful, creepy, lonely sound that combines with the muted horn right at the end of each of these phrases. And then you could focus in on how this harmonic glissando is working its way up the sound picture as the melody works its way down. Or you could just listen to all of those effects at once. All right, but however you listen to it, enjoy this next excerpt accompanied by the Thailand Philharmonic Orchestra. And I will see you on the last screen for today's lecture. In our last screen for today, you'll notice that almost everything is identical to the end of the first screen of Ravel's orchestration that we saw three screens ago. At least for these particular little phrases here of clarinets, bass clarinet, bassoons, contrabassoon combining with the middle and lower strings, it's all pretty much scored identically. So let's just focus on what is not identical. <laughs> and that is this interrupting low B flat. You might recall that there was just one little change when the piano score came back to this bum idea. And that was going from the G flat, there was an interrupting B flat. Okay, so this is sort of reversing things around. Staccato from the winds, the strings use that staccato as punctuation for very tenuto playing here usually. And as they're holding this G flat, we've got the winds coming back and hitting this boom, grace note of concert C flat into B flat, basically played as low as each instrument can play having the low horns, second and fourth, punching that B-flat an octave higher, accompanied by a bit of rhythmic punctuation here. Once again, very dry cymbal hit and bass drum. And I don't really know if this is going to make much of a difference, this um, harp grace note. And might I add, certain pitches are really hard to reach with the right hand. This is very, very low. and. I'm imagining that most harpists would probably just play this with one hand, ba bum because I would say this B-flat would be about as low as the harpist could reach, especially since they've got hands coming from either direction going around their strings and around the frame of the instrument reaching towards the lowest notes. So any harpists out there, you could back me up on this or contradict me, that's cool but I would imagine that this would probably just be played by the left hand, where it would be a lot easier to reach. Then here we've got bum, 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 bum. And this is kind of ordinary, I think, compared to what happened before. Just kind of the same elements, bassoons, doing that same little grace note, C flat to B flat, and then coming up to a C. Notice that it's the third trombone and tuba that really dig in to this pitch while the other instruments let go. Pizzicato lower strings, of course, are not going to have any carrying power compared to this. And then they are the ones who are allowed to just finish it off with one last little B flat staccato. And what happens after that? 
we get into some very interesting, very titanic, very vainglorious scoring, <laughs> right? The Gnomus doesn't just dream of frightening people. He wants to frighten the entire world, and he's going to show how terrifically, phantasmagorically terrifying that he possibly can be. But pretty much it's just in his dreams, as we will see. I think all that he manages to do is just chase people off at the end of the movement, as I sort of imagine it in my mind, of what possibly Mussorgsky might have been thinking. So listen to all of those things. Note that this is essentially identical scoring. Then we've got the sustained G flats in the lower strings, which are sort of bitten off by the horns and lower winds, plus a little bit of punch from the percussion and probably an ineffectual note from the harp. And then the way that those same elements come back to a degree, but the very lowest of the heavy brass take over on this snarling C flat note, which is eventually released to a low B flat staccato octave. Listen for all of those things. And I will see you pretty soon with part two of Nomus. Really, really enjoying bringing you this series. This is so much fun, and this is such a great movement. And I'll have lots to say about the second part, which, as you'll see, is kind of twice as long as what I covered here. But it may go faster because a lot of those pages are slower and have a more open construction that we can look at pretty quickly. So keep your eyes open, watch very carefully as Thailand Philharmonic Orchestra accompanies your reading of this page, and I'll see you soon.